welcome back to the David67 Celtic News YouTube channel, last video of uh, 2023. Obviously a very happy and delighted David67 after Celtic's thumping perfect 2-1 win against Rangers yesterday. Uh, today's video is basically going to be a post-game review. We chat regarding who played well, who didn't play well, what the key factors were in my mind and also we chat regarding a few of the potential controversies in the game. Before we get going, if you haven't already, um, but do enjoy the videos and the content, remembering there's also a daily trivia question on the channel each day regarding Celtic, and there are actually two uh, questions today in the community section. Um, both relating to the 2022-23 season stats. So, um, if you do like the channel, do click that like button, click the subscribe button as well. Keep those slow, those subscriber numbers going up slowly. Now, obviously, great win for Celtic yesterday. I thought Celtic dominated the game, very much deserved to win the game. There were only some brief spells where Rangers uh, got really a... Uh, a toehold in the game and I think part of the reason that Rangers actually had a good last 10-15 uh, minutes um, of the game and then the a mysterious 11 minutes of added time was the fact that Re Rogers made I thought rather, rather stupid tactical blunder with the tri triple substitution in around about the 81st minute um, we were 2-0 uh, up we were playing against 10 men at that point. Um, Rangers had, rather mysteriously for me, taken off a midfielder and shoved on another central defender. For me, uh, Rangers should really go on with a back three um, and uh, kept the midfield uh, a competition um, and, and, and strengthened their attacking uh, position, but they instead seemed to be shutting up shop. However, Rogers very much uh, let Rangers, for me, back into the game, taking off Palma and Maeda, who had done an absolute ton of work tracking back down the wings into midfield, tracking back to help out Greg Taylor and um, Alison Johnston um, in defence, and uh, Palma and Maeda pretty much kept Tavernier and Yilmaz back in the Rangers defensive third. Tavernier hardly got forward in the whole game until suddenly we bring on Mikey Johnston, who was absolutely clueless in defence, let Tavernier go multiple times. Um, we were actually quite lucky that Greg Taylor and Liam Scales were able to cover across on the two occasions that Johnston completely lost um, Tavernier going forward. Um, uh, Lila Bada did a wee bit of a better job down the other side. Um, taking off Kyogo, putting on O, I think was a reasonable thing to do. Um, o did manage to win a few free kicks, did manage to hold the ball up, um, kept the Rangers uh, central defenders a bit busy, um, managed to get Connor Goldson booked. Quite why John Stutter didn't get booked for um, whacking O in the head, I don't know. But uh, um, uh, mysteriously, Nick Walsh, the referee, saw that as a foul by O on Sutter rather than a foul of Sutter on O. Presumably, um, O must have headbutted um, Sutter's forearm rather than Sutter's forearm accidentally or deliberately whacking O in the head. Either way, didn't matter in the long run. Similarly, when we took off Paulo Bernardo, perfectly reasonable thing to do. I think he was getting a bit tired. Uh, he had a couple of dodgy tackles. I don't think actually the one a lot of folk are citing as should have been a definite yellow, second yellow card and thus a red card was that. I think it was slightly mistimed, um, slightly slipped on the wet grass. I think Goldson knew the potential implications of it and made an absolute meal of the foul. There was no real injury, there was no real threat. It was simply 
a slightly mistimed tackle and a collision of two legs. Um, and then Goldson, as he has perfected in the last year or two for Rangers, managed to make it look like he'd broken his leg. Similar to the way that he is very good at buying penalty kicks in the opposition box after a slight tug on his shirt. Anyway, moving on. Um, David Turnbull came on pretty much. Um, uh, didn't contribute hardly at all. I think he had one very weak shot. Um, no real threat in terms of the final third. And as is always the case with David Turnbull, nothing in the middle third helping out the midfield too um, of O'Reilly and McGregor and never tracks back to help defence. Um, and I was really rather confused as, as to why, if Hatati's fit, why it wasn't Hatati coming on instead of Turnbull to replace Bernardo. I thought, um, as I say in the title of this video, I thought the midfield three, Bernardo, O'Reilly and McGregor were the keys. I think uh, they form a very good partnership. I think Bernardo tracks back to allow McGregor to go forward. I think McGregor and Bernardo both can hang back and battle in midfield to let O'Reilly be more of a threat in the final third, um, as was the case with O'Reilly uh, helping set up Kuyogo's brilliant goal just after half time. And I think actually if Hitati isn't fit to play uh, from the start or isn't fit to play at all, I think Bernardo, McGregor and O'Reilly should be our midfield three and go for, for the future period. Um, and hopefully we can keep hold of Matt O'Reilly in the winter transfer break uh, coming up uh, after the St. Murden match. Um, and... Uh, if if and when Hatati does become back fully fit, and assuming that he is off to the Asian Cup, uh, hopefully Bernardo, McGregor and O'Reilly can keep that partnership going uh, right up to the end of May. Uh, a lot of um, Celtic fans and pundits and uh, were rather sceptical of Paolo Bernardo's skills. I thought right from the start, having watched uh, his highlight reels, read his stats, uh, looked at his performances for the Portuguese under-21 side. I thought he was a player of quality. I don't think um, Brendan Rodgers quite knew how to use him to start with. Um, I think he's a very intelligent player, a good box-to-box -box player, uh, for the most part a good tackler, um, and as was shown with his wonderful goal uh, in the first half, an uh, excellent finisher. Very powerful shot, a good passer, and a good ability to break up play and restart play. And I really do think these performances that he's had in the last few weeks should convince Rodgers and the scouting team to uh, finalise him as a permanent signing uh, this summer coming. Celtic started very well, uh, McGregor and O'Reilly brilliant in midfield, they were my two man of the matches, with uh, McGregor being the actual full man of the match for me, uh, in the rate short video ratings I gave um, McGregor a 9 and O'Reilly an 8.5 and, and I think the other player who needs a massive special mention was uh, Mike Navrocki, came on to replace Stephen Welsh after what looks like a dislocated shoulder. Um, I thought Welsh had looked rather nervous and shaky. Um, 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 I thought was a potential liability. We were quite lucky that uh, it was Dessers who was the Rangers forward yesterday rather than a more uh, dangerous forward. I think um, someone like a Morelos or... Uh, Similar could have actually ha um, really punished us, but thankfully Dessers is pretty useless, as was evidenced by his extremely weak uh, run and finish in the first half when he escaped uh, Alistair Johnston, and some similarly very, very weak attempts in the second half. We were very lucky that Dessers was playing up front for them, um, 
but overall the Rangers strikers this season have been pretty poor um, and very injury prone. So as I said, I think Mike Navrocki needs a massive um, a round of applause, brave performance, battled very hard, did look a wee bit lacking that sharpness, which is all down to Rogers, who hasn't played him um, at all since he got back from injury. Rogers seemed to invent the fact that Navrocki has been having niggly injuries in training. Um, it's rather mysterious that these the wee niggly injuries in training only occur when he's made the mistake of leaving a perfectly good player out for weeks and weeks and weeks and then throwing them in at the deep end. Um, somehow, um, various players have had wee niggly injuries that have kept them out. Odin Tiago home, Iowata, players that should have been getting um, game time on a regular basis all season, um, and have had niggly injuries that, that Rodgers has had to keep them out for. Um, I think it really does show that Navrocki is should be one of our central defensive two. Um, I think personally, given Welsh's and um, Carter Vickers' injury problems this season, also I don't think that uh, Welsh is anywhere near as good as Navrocki, or for that matter, I don't think Welsh is anywhere near as good as Lagabielka. And also I think CCV has been a bit under par. I think he hasn't really been properly fit all season. So for me, actually, Navrocki and Liam Scales should be our first choice central defensive partnership, even when CCV is back fit. Some people might think it's a little bit controversial, controversial given how good CCV has been, but um, a lot of his performances this season have been a wee bit slow. <clears throat> He's now having his third spell out injury, uh, injured, um, and it doesn't feel as if for, uh, so, um, CCV or, and Scales actually form a terribly good partnership or understanding. And I thought once Navrocki and Scales got played together for about five, ten minutes, they looked actually a very good partnership, uh, covered um, back well behind each other. Um, and Navrocki uh, showed for me a lot of good intelligence, covering down the left wing very nicely to tackle. Uh, Stephen Wright, when Wright was making a bit of a threat down that side, um, came forward into the midfield and up to the halfway line, pretty good at dist distributing, so um, I gave Navrocki an 8 out of 10 as well. Um, other good mentions, I think, for Joe Hart in the first half, two super duper saves um, that uh, could easily have been goals. Both occasions he managed to um, ensure. Uh, the ball didn't go out to uh, incoming Ranger striker. Personally, I do fault him a wee bit for the Tavernier free kick. Brilliant free kick by Tavernier, but I do feel Joe Hart shouldn't be getting beaten um, at the post. Um, so probably a combination of the wall not being properly lined up uh, to cover that post um, properly. Um, and to uh, Joe Hart just being a wee bit slow getting across to cover that area of the goal. Um, hopefully, though, it's something that Celtic are working on as uh, goals in that sort of situation have been a recurring problem this season and last season. And we don't seem to have found a good solution to it. Maybe the solution is a better, younger, more agile goalkeeper hopefully Rogers will go back on his initial thought of not looking to upgrade goalkeeper until the summer um, as I think Celtic do need to ensure um, winning the cup and the double in the second half of the season I think we do need to ensure that we've got two uh, high quality goalkeepers and I think we need to upgrade on Joe Hart Kyogo um, did what Kyogo does I thought he was busy. I thought he harassed and pressed the Rangers defenders and goalkeeper. He slowed down Rangers distribution. A few times he and Palma and Maida managed to win the ball back in the Rangers defensive third. A couple of near chances also with that. Um, and an absolutely stupendous goal by Kyogo just after half time. Uh, completely fooled. Um, 
Goldson, who got himself into a terrible position, opened up the space, um, used Dyson Midas run as a distraction and dummy, and then a beautiful curling shot right across Butland into the top corner. I think it was an unsavable shot, mostly due to the wonderful curve that Kiyoga put on the ball that took it high and wide of Butland's despairing drop dive. Otherwise, he didn't really have terribly many chances. There was one where he actually was flagged offside wrongly, but he didn't manage to beat um, Butland anyway when he got through. Um, don't really remember terribly many, terribly many other chances for Kyogo in the match, uh, but um, he can't really do terribly much more than score what proved to be the winning goal. As I said, perfectly fine to take off Kyogo with 10 minutes to go, or what turned out to be 20 minutes to go, with Nick Walsh finding 11 minutes of added time. Um, part of the reason I think um, O has the ability to maybe more hold up the play, bring midfield onto him, um, has more of ability maybe to, to win a free kick off Goldson and Suter in those scenarios. As I said, I think Celtic did lose control of the midfield when we brought on Turnbull instead of um, Bernardo. Hatati would have been a much better option at that time. And um, when we did the triple substitution, taking off Maida and Palma, I think we then freed up the Rangers players down the left and the right. Taverni then became a threat going down the right. Mike Johnson useless. Um, a bad, not too bad few promising runs, touches, getting forward, did track back a bit to help out on the right. Um, and it was absolutely wonderful to hear uh, the massive cheer and applause and welcome for Lee Labada making his way back after a long spell of injury. Uh, it was great that the Celtic fans wel welcomed him back so warmly. And... Um, and it was great to see. Moving on to the last few little controversial things, um, rather bemused um, with the penalty decision that was not that was not given, quite rightly not given. Um, referee didn't give it as a penalty on the pitch. The assistant referee looking across didn't give it as a penalty. Didn't didn't wave his flag for Nick Walsh. Thus, wasn't given the, as a penalty on the pitch. Um, as was stated by uh, Pat Nevin, the BBC pundit on the radio. Um, there were four angles on the Johnston, um, inverted commas, handball. Three were very much inconclusive. A fourth one that does look like the ball did make contact accidentally with uh, Alice Johnston's hand. It's in... Uh, a perfectly reasonable position, um, given the fact that he was tussling for the ball on the byline, trying to shepherd the ball out. Um, purely accidental, uh, no expanding of the silhouette, no uh, taking advantage. Um, and it really does bemuse me the um, clamour for a penalty for that, in contrast to when Conor Goldson palmed the ball over the bar which was um, simply he was defending his face. He put his hands, in Goldson's case, above his head and pushed the ball over the bar. It's clearly a deliberate act. It expanded his body and his silhouette and gained an advantage for his team. However, uh, it was clearly offside by Sima in the preparation to the goals. Some rather odd comments from ex-referees to say that offside only gets involved if there is a, a significant incident after, which is typically a goal. However, given the fact that Simmer being offside led up to the potential penalty, clearly the potential penalty following the clear offside is a significant incident, and thus Willie Collum. The VAR referee was perfectly within his rights to um, say there's offside, there's been a significant incident that predates or 
uh, it's before the penalty in, in incident, thus it's offside. Um, so no real, no real controversy there when you think about it. Similarly, as I said, um, also would appear that Willie Collum didn't deem that the positioning of Johnson's hand was unnatural. He thought it was a, a, a normal body silhouette, hands out uh, slightly to the sides for balance. Um, penalties are always in these days extremely confusing. Um, however, referee on the pitch didn't give the penalty. System referee, the other side, looking across, didn't give the penalty. The VAR referee didn't give the penalty, didn't think it was worthwhile asking Nick Walsh to have a look at it again, and there it ends. Rangers demanding that VAR tapes are released, that Willie Collum comes out um, and gives a full interview uh, under cross-examination by the Rangers legal team. Just, just joking about that second part. But Clement and the Rangers uh, club demanding a steward's inquiry, demanding all tapes and um, transcripts are released. Now, um, those sorts of things are available in English football, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, have not been made available in Scotland. Whether it's helpful or not, I don't know. I've never been a massive fan of VAR anyway. Nine times out of ten, it just creates more controversy. Um, and, um, so I think best to move on. Um, Rangers also clamouring for several second yellow cards and red cards. As I said before, I think Bernardo's was a benign uh, slight mistiming, a tangle of legs that was uh, over-egged by Goldson to try and get a second booking. Um, Alsa Johnson did um, catch accidentally Sima, but it was clearly unintentional, it wasn't reckless. He wasn't endangering his opponent, and if Johnson's was the yellow card, so were the two by Suter, the one by Sterling. Um, with Sterling's one, you have to remember, appearing to have broken Matt O'Reilly's nose. Um, so if Johnson deserved a, a yellow card, Suter deserved two, and Sterling deserved one, and then Sterling then got away with a rather nasty challenge. Uh, on one of the Celtic defenders late in the game as well. Also, bizarrely, um, Philip Clement um, seemed to think the mere fact that you have more shots in a game is what should decide who wins and who loses. Um, thought it would rather be losing. Celtic had 56% of possession to 44. We did have two less shots than, than Rangers. However, we had five on go shot on goal to their three. Um, we had more corners than them, four to two, um, and um, I think probably uh, Clermont and Rangers fans would be the only people who think that Rangers deserved anything out of the game. I think Celtic fully deserved the win, much better throughout, and Celtic's big players stepped up, particularly O'Reilly and McGregor. They dominated Rangers midfield. Cantwell really ineffective. Sterling did try hard. McCausland, um, their wide young player, I think is very impressive. He beat Greg Taylor quite a few times, um, and I think he uh, was quite a threat. Um, uh, but happily, a combination of Taylor, Scales, Navrocki, uh, and the midfield two, and our tracking back wingers. Um, managed to keep him under control and otherwise I think a lot of the Rangers players were under par and say thankfully Dessers had a typical Dessers performance which was useless. I think we'll just finish things off, off that stage there. So it's been a wee bit rambly, something happens when you're happy and um, things have gone well for yourself and your team. Uh, so we're going to be going into the game against St Midden in a couple of days' time with an eight-point lead. Hopefully that uh, continues as an eight-point lead or better. Uh, Rangers do have a tricky game against Kilmarnock um, a couple of hours before we are playing St Mirren. Uh, so uh, maybe Kilmarnock will do 
uh, Celtic a wee favour um, with a performance similar to the one they had when they beat us 2-1. Um, so we'll cross our fingers for that. Uh, so finishing off there, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, Happy New Year to all those uh, watching and subscribing as well. And for today and for 2023, goodbye and hail, hail.